a space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. Welcome to the January 2024 programme of A Space to Speak Your Mind, a radio show and a podcast about mental health and well-being made by people with lived experience in association with Cornwall Mind. We do occasionally cover subjects that some listeners may find distressing and for more information, help and support, you can visit cornwallmind.org. Happy New Year, I'm Richard. I hope you've had a welcome break over the Christmas period. And as we start a brand new year, we're going to find out today on the show how walking can be good for your mental health with TV presenter and mental health advocate Sean Fletcher. As people experiencing homelessness is at an all-time high, Matthew Borden from leading homelessness charity St Mungo's is going to explain how close the issue is for many and how we can help those most vulnerable in our communities. And J.D. Donovan from the London College of Contemporary Music will tell us how young people are using music as a platform to overcome their struggles of living with neurodivergence. First, though, here's Joe from Cornwall Mind to welcome in the new year. A space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Hope everyone had a nice, peaceful, festive break. So we're at the start of a brand new year, and it's a time when people often think about starting something new, trying something, making changes. And we know this often stems from the classic New Year's resolutions. We don't think that making New Year's resolutions is particularly healthy always because it can set us up to fail and put unnecessary pressure on ourselves. So we think it's better if people think about making positive changes to their life, especially around improving their health and well-being. I mean, it could be a really good idea just to set yourself really small goals and challenges, but realistic goals and challenges. It could be something like increasing exercise, learning something new, making a simple change to improve your diet. Anything that involves self-care and improving quality of life. But sometimes people don't know where to start and that's when we can help. Taking those first steps can be daunting. But we've got a range of wellbeing groups to help improve your mental health and wellbeing. And getting involved with our groups offers the opportunity for you to meet new people, learn new skills and help yourself stay well which I think is really important. Or you could volunteer for us. We've got various roles and that can really help to improve your well-being. It offers you a sense of purpose and it can really boost your self-esteem. Or you can fundraise for us. Why not set yourself a personal challenge or fundraise at work or hold an event? We can support you with it and it could give you a real sense of achievement. And we want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for their generous donations and amazing fundraising events and support last year. Everyone's just been amazing. It was another difficult year, especially financially. We were still facing lots of difficult times around the cost of living crisis. But we've just been blown away by people wanting to support mental health in Cornwall. We're so grateful and we wouldn't be here without people's commitment and passion to better mental health in the county. So to everyone out there that helped last year, we thank you so much. So to find out about all our groups and how to volunteer and fundraise for us, just visit our website, cornwallmind.org, and also follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Cornwall Mind. We post all the news and updates there too. A space to speak your mind. They say it's good to talk, and since the pandemic, there's been a real momentum for people to open up about their mental health. But perhaps it's also good to walk too, with many people taking solace in the great outdoors. For mental health advocate and TV presenter Sean Fletcher, going for walks has made a huge difference to how he feels both mentally and physically, and he's here now to tell me why. Hi, Richard. Hi, good to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, I just think exercise is really important, but walking is so accessible to everyone. So to sort of give a bit of background about myself, I'm a mental health campaigner, I have been for several years, but I, I do a lot of the filming I do, I've actually been on Good Morning Britain this morning, so that's in the studio, but a lot of the other stuff I do is out and about in the country, in parks, in, I mean, it doesn't have to be a national park, it could be just like by a river, it could be in a city, but green spaces. I do quite a lot in Wales, I work on Country File, but there's a Welsh programme called Coast and Country I work on, I've done a few series, walking series, like Wonders of the Coast Path on ITV, which is walking the Wales Coast Path, and Wonders of the Border, which is walking along the Wales-England border. So being outdoors is quite a big part of what I do in my job. I just always think to myself, this is actually, it's free, it's easy. I do a bit of running as well. I'm a bit injured at the moment. And running isn't for everyone, but walking, most people can get out and just even have a five minute stroll, even if you live in a city, in your local park. It's quite accessible, it's free. And the other thing I find about it is it's really sociable. So if you walk with someone, it's something a bit special about that, that it's a little bit different to if you sit and have a coffee with someone, you're face to face and you sort of have to fill all the gaps. Walking, you can sort of go silent for a bit and it's sort of okay. And that means I think you have some of the best conversations when you're walking. So those are just some of the reasons why I feel like a real advocate for walking. 
really for us down here in Cornwall, we've got the coastal path, we've got so many nice places to walk. But as you say, even if you don't have that, just going for a walk in your lunch break or getting out and just getting some fresh air because it does have that both physical and mental health qualities, doesn't it? Yeah, Richard, don't you feel that when you get out, it doesn't matter where it is, if it's just in the local park in a city, but you know, in Cornwall, of course, you're blessed with amazing countryside. And you sort of, you get out of the car or whatever, you walk outside and there's a tree or there's green space, there's a park or whatever. And you just, I don't know, there's something, I just sort of want to take a deep breath. There's something like my instinct. I just sort of want to stop and take a deep breath. And I think sometimes in our busy lives, it's really important to do that. Actually, not sometimes, all the time. It's really important to just have that not too far away from you. So we're all on our phones. We're all busy doing stuff. We're working, you know, there's nonstop. You've got kids, you've got to collect them from this play group or school or you know works demanding this and it never really switch off but I do find when I get outside particularly in really nice countryside I just sort of take a deep breath and it helps me stop almost like I'm some sort of rechargeable battery and this is the time where I'm being plugged in and recharged the other thing about walking of course is I think you mentioned the exercise and when you do exercise I don't think it's just me because I think it's scientifically proven but about two hours after doing exercise, if you walk you know, an hour or so, I start to feel really good. I sort of feel quite positive. I don't know what it is. And I, I'm sure and maybe it's just in my head, but I think that is the endorphins working. And you just feel glass half full rather than glass half empty that you might have been before. Problems that seem big problems don't seem as bad. You know, it just sort of it's like, you know, like you walk down your street and on a rainy day, it looks quite miserable. But on a sunny day, it's the same street, but it looks good. It's like that, that effect after exercise. It feels like it's a sunny day rather than a rainy day. Yeah, it's strange. I actually went for a walk yesterday and about halfway through, the heavens opened up and the rain came down. But you know what? You're absolutely right. If I'd have been at home, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it. But actually, I was out in the fresh air. It was quite nice. I got back and felt really good afterwards. But it's interesting there what you're saying about being out with other people, especially children, because it does give you that chance to have a conversation and being in different surroundings and being away from all the high tech things that we've got with our phones and laptops and all of that. Just being out in the open air and it does allow us, especially with those endorphins, to feel a bit more relaxed and just to be able to open up a bit more. And as you were saying there with children, having a conversation that you might not normally have. Yeah, I mean, if you've got children, you may have young children and so you wouldn't be able to walk so far, but that's still that exercise and getting outside is good. And probably when they're that age, teaching them about nature and how old a tree is. I mean, some trees are sort of 500 years old. That's sort of quite mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing for me as an adult, but for a child. But just like seeing birds and seeing wildlife and describing why the leaves are on the floor now, but then in the spring they're growing and all those sorts of things with younger kids, older kids. Probably if you've got teenagers, they're not really interested in that sort of stuff. But you might find it hard to talk to them because teenagers do shut you off or they do think as parents, they think, oh, well, you know, you're not very cool. I want to hang out with my peer group. And they invest a lot of time in that rather than perhaps as parents. There'll be lots of parents listening who think, yeah, I, I know that familiar feeling. But actually, when you walk, as I said, I think it's quite a good place to have a conversation. I think it's quite a good place to be comfortable in that conversation because, as I said, if there's silences, it's sort of okay. But then you might just start a conversation again and then you might just not talk for a bit. There's no pressure on the conversation. Whereas if you sat down and had a coffee, you would need to fill all those gaps. And that's good. And that has a real place. But maybe if you're having a conversation with your teenager, he doesn't really want to talk. Walking is a better place to do it because those silences don't really matter. And also you know, with a work colleague or just someone you feel that maybe they've got things going on that you just want to have a conversation and just see where it naturally goes. Down here at Cornwall Mind, we have a walking group in Newquay and we also have hope walks. I don't know whether you know about these, but for someone who's lost a person to suicide, it's a chance to have a walk and a talk with others who've experienced a loss too. So walking can have so many different benefits for what people are going through. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier about how you went out and it was, I think it was sunny, wasn't it? And then it started to rain and you probably wouldn't have gone out had it been raining. And I realised as I was saying that analogy, I was thinking, oh yeah, I'm talking about how when you do exercise, it, your mind can feel a bit sunnier than it was before. Obviously, this country, it can get really wet, it can get miserable for weeks on end, and it can be a real barrier, I think. That can be a real issue. Research we've done with Go Outdoors with the Sats On For Mind campaign is saying that, that actually the weather and the sort of the dark, the early night, you know, how it's sort of like 3.30 and it starts to get dark, that can sort of prevent people from going out. And all I would say is, if it's bad weather, if you can get the right gift, you can just get a waterproof on, and it, they don't you have to cost that much. You can get out, and in some ways, when it's tipping it down, and then, you know, the moment when the sun suddenly comes out, you actually really appreciate those moments but more. And I think getting out, even in that bad weather, even when it's getting a bit dark or even, you know, with some of those days when it's just dull all day, 
I think it's really important and probably more important to get out on those days than in the middle of August when it's sunny and, you know, everybody wants to be out. It's actually more important in the winter that you make an effort to get out. And as you say, with work colleagues, with kids, maybe even on your own. But I think those days are really, really important. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, these shorter days, they affect me so much. I need that natural light. I need to be outside. And sometimes you just don't have enough time in the day to be able to do that. But it is finding the time. And, and I think that's a good start for the day as well. I mean, that might not be for everyone. You might want to do it at the end of the day when you're feeling a bit more relaxed. But it's just finding that five or 10 minutes. So just tell me a bit more about this campaign then and what you're hoping to achieve. Yeah, but it basically ties in with everything we've been talking about now. Hats on for Mind. It's this brilliant campaign that's uh, raising funds for the mental health charity Mind, but also highlighting the benefits of getting outdoors in nature and the benefits are huge on our mental health so our mental well-being our mental health it is automatically better when we get outside and we walk so what we're doing is the retailers go outdoors blacks millets and um, fishing republic have teamed together so they're selling there's a selection of hats that are designed for hats and flasks actually so you can have your cup of tea you can put your hat on because a lot of the heat when we're outside and we're cold is lost through our head so you're wearing your hat you've got your flask with your tea they're designed by me i've designed one of them mine's an orange one and i actually quite like the flask there it's got a a little bit of orange in it but it's got it's actually it's a bit black and white really like it i'm basically trying to get ahead of the other people who have designed hats of last i want more people to buy my one but the other ones are helen skelton julia bradbury gethin jones and david seaman we've all designed our own versions of these and 100 percent of the proceeds go to mine so you, you go to one of those shops that i mentioned go outdoors blacks millets or fishing republic and buy one of those or both a hat and a flask and I think it's like £10 for the hat and £10 for the flask. And for kids, it's a bit cheaper for kids' versions of those. And all of that money goes to Mind. So it's sort of a double-pronged attack. Firstly, you're raising money. We're raising money for Mind that's going to go to great causes, helping people who are really struggling with their mental health. But the other side, the flip side is, it just puts it in your mind, doesn't it? Oh, actually, I've got that hat. I'm going to go out because I can stay warm. I'm going to get outside. It's two things. And I always found this with a mental health campaigner. You need to raise money for all this stuff, but it's actually raising awareness as well. So that it's in people's second nature that, oh, I'm going to go out for a walk. You said you go out really early in the morning. Get that into your routine. So it's not like, oh, this is a special effort that I just did on a Saturday. I'm going to actually walk to work. I'm going to walk across the park on my way to work this day. I'm going to get off the bus earlier and I'm going to do a bit of a walk on the way to work so I can incorporate that in my day. That's sort of basically just getting outside and being encouraged to do that is sort of at the heart of this campaign. I think what's really good as well, because if you are getting one of these hats as well, and you can bring the conversation up about, oh, yeah, you know, I've bought this hat. It's going to mind the mental health charity. And that might open up a bit of a conversation as well. Oh, gosh. Yeah, exactly. I think it's the conversation, isn't it, about maybe you start talking about mind, but then that maybe allows someone to open up and say, actually, do you know, what? I'm really struggling because it is this stigma with mental health. It's um, with mental illness is it's really powerful. You know, if you have a broken leg, you might even brag about it. Yeah, I was playing football and I broke my leg. You know, if you have the equivalent with mental illness, I think our natural instinct is I don't want to tell anyone because I'll be judged. I'll be told that you know people will think I'm not up to the job or I'm weak or whatever. And so people just naturally don't want to talk about their own mental health issues. And as you say, if you've got the hat and it's got the mind logo on and it just prompts that conversation about mind. And then that allows someone to say, actually, do you know what? I'm finding things hard. I mean, I'm not exaggerating and saying that could save a life. So this is important stuff. So if people want to donate to mind, just tell us where they can go. Yeah. So it's all those retailers go outdoors, blacks, millets, fishing republic. I'm sure you'll have one of those nearby you. You can buy the hats, you can buy the flasks. 100% of the proceeds go to mind. Or you can go online. You can get these things online. I mean, you know, at this time of year, a hat or a flask. And they really look really good. My one's best. Mine's um, this orange hat. I actually really like it. I know I'm plugging my one quite a bit more. But if there are loads of places you can get these. Get one of mine. But also Helen, Julia or Gethin's or David's ones are good as well. Thank you so much. We'll have a look on the website and we'll put a link in our details of the podcast that people might be listening to right now. But for the moment, Sean Fletcher, mental health advocate and TV presenter, thank you so much for joining us. Richard, great to talk to you. Thank you. A space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. In 2023, the music industry saw record-breaking tours from the likes of Beyonce and Taylor Swift, as well as major performances from artists across the globe. One of the standout performances was Louis Capaldi's headline act at the Glastonbury Festival, where the crowd sung his song back to him after his tics interfered. The heartwarming moment happened after he recently opened up about his Tourette syndrome. Other chart-topping acts have followed in Capaldi's footsteps of transparency around neurodivergence, with Robbie Williams, Doja Cat, Billie Eilish and Example all speaking up about personal experiences last year. 
As the music industry continues moving ahead to create new possibilities and inclusive experiences, over half of those aged 16 to 24 believe that music and the creative industries provide better opportunities for employment than other industries for neurodiverse individuals. J.D. Donovan, who's the industry liaison and artist manager at the London College of Contemporary Music, has seen firsthand how young people are using music as a platform to overcome their struggles of living with neurodivergence, and he's joining me now. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Richard. So why is it important for music artists to speak up about their neurodivergence? Well, neurodiversity is something that in society these days we're becoming more aware of. And I think huge, huge credit to those artists who are being open and transparent about their challenges and also their success and their experience of being a neurodiverse individual. Neurodiversity is technically defined as the range of differences in individual brain function and behavioural traits across the population. But that could cover things like ADHD, Tourette's, as you mentioned with Lewis Capaldi. But artists are really speaking out about it. There's more of a safe space for them to do so. And I think... Lewis's performance at Glastonbury, really heartwarming, where the crowd did sing Someone You Love back to him, is perhaps his biggest track, and he sort of joined in where he could, really sort of broke down, sort of to me at least, as a watcher and as an industry professional, broke down any sort of barriers. It was a real sort of game-changing moment, and things seemed to have shifted on from there. So, I mean, from your experience and from the work you do, how does music actually help people explore their own neurodivergence? I think the music is a very creative pursuit. You know, you need to have a creative mind. It's not just paint by numbers and, and something a little bit more logistical. It is about being creative. And I think my experience of working with neurodiverse individuals is that they are more creative. And music really allows you to put your emotions into play. And it allows you to build a connection with other people. Music is, I always believe, a force for good. You listen to a track, it can make you feel one way or another way. It can completely change your day if you listen to your favourite piece of music in the morning. So being able to create that is a real outlet for people who are neurodiverse who might be struggling with a certain condition or a challenge. It's a way of expressing themselves. So we were talking before about Luis Capaldi, but I mean, there were so many and it just seemed it's on the increase as well about people talking about their own experience. So from 2023 itself, what were the things or the standout highlights that you recognise? Well, I think Lewis's moment at Glastonbury by far. I think obviously Robbie Williams' documentary, he's being unbelievably open about his experiences when he was a member of Take That, you know, in the early 90s and his struggles that weren't recognised at that point. But at London College of Contemporary Music, we've done some research into this, what I think is a bit of a phenomenon, a real great moment. And we found that over 54% of people aged 16 to 24 believe that neurodiverse music and musicians have changed their general perception of neurodiversity as a whole. And even more of that same age bracket believe that music and the creative industries provide better opportunities for employment than other industries. So, you know, we're seeing that superstar artists, big credit to them setting the trend of transparency and being open, and then younger people reacting to that. And this is so, so critical to me in what I do, because this is the future. I think in our country, we've perhaps been a little bit backwards at points of how we've approached certain topics. But this is sort of showing that the next generation are understanding and appreciating it and moving forward together. I think what's quite interesting, at Cornwall Mind, we have a singing for wellbeing group and we also have a music group. And just the actual using music and using lyrics is just so important towards our mental health. Massively. Performing music is more than just creating it. It's a physical thing to use your voice, to play an instrument, to perform on stage, to dance, to move around. Like, it's such a great, as I say, my word is outlet. It's a way of expressing yourself, but it's also a physical thing as well. I think, you know, if you're feeling down, a little bit of exercise in your day can help you feel good. But music is sort of using all skills and all sort of bodily functions to change things. And I think obviously a massive commend the work that you do with your charity and, and the people as part of it, because it really does make a difference. Yeah, I mean, it's creating something as well, isn't it? You're learning, you're creating, having that shared experience as well with other people. Yeah, absolutely. And music is the biggest shared experience that there is. And what I say to early career musicians I work with at LCCM and beyond is that you're finding your crowd when you do this. And one thing that never goes away is passion, just like you're passionate about sports, but music is something you're passionate about. And I'm saying follow your passion and you'll find your crowd. No matter what you're dealing with, it's always out there to be found if you just keep going with what it is. And at LCCM, we're really, really proud to have a sort of safe space for people who believe they are or identify as neurodiverse. And we like to say that we're the first choice for neurodiverse musicians and individuals to be able to come and create, to find their community, that crowd, and just get started. I think what's really great as well is the way the audience have responded as well. So do you think music culture is changing with the generational shift towards openness around neurodivergence? 
Massively. I mean, 150%, I'd say it is. And I think some fantastic young artists coming through day by day who are much more transparent and open. And I'm not by that's no means lambasting or criticizing previous artists. They were just part of a system perhaps that wasn't as open. And I wish that they had the opportunity to say they were. I was thinking today about someone even like Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart from the 1700s, and he probably would be identified as neurodiverse today. That's 300 years ago, but he would now. And I think quite a lot of the big, big artists, musicians would do as well. And it's a shame that that platform wasn't there for them. It does feel that it is now. And if people want more information on what we've been talking about today, is there somewhere that they can go? Yeah. So the best thing to do to see a peek into our world at LCCM is to go to our Instagram, which is at LCCM London. And you can see everything that we're up to there, our students' life at the college and all the amazing events we have too. That's fantastic. That's J.D. Donovan, who's the industry liaison and artist manager at the London College of Contemporary Music. Thank you so much. Thank you. A space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. People experiencing homelessness is at an all-time high. And here in the southwest, nearly a fifth of us have been in temporary accommodation or are aware of a person who may have been. With 16% having experienced hidden homelessness, such as sofa surfing, and 12% have either slept on the streets or know someone who has. Matthew Borden from leading homeless charity St Mungo's knows how close the issue of homelessness is for many and how we can all help those most vulnerable in our communities. So thank you for being here, Matthew. Hi, thank you. Thank you. So what has caused this increase in figures that we're seeing? Well, I mean, firstly, I just wanted to reflect on some of those statistics you just read out. I mean, I think it's staggering and it's really been a very sharp increase in the last year in particular. There are a number of reasons for that and uh, often quite complicated reasons for every individual story who may have ended up either sleeping on our streets or, as you said, hidden homeless. But I do think the current cost of living crisis is having a huge impact and resulting in a number of people sleeping on our streets who have never been in that situation before. And we're even seeing people sort of in work or recently having stopped work sleeping rough at the moment. And talk to me more about hidden homelessness, because that's something we don't really think about so much. And I don't think it's even really recognised in the official figures. Yeah, that's right. So a lot of our work does focus on rough sleeping and that really extreme and sharp end of homelessness, which is very visible. But there are a greater proportion of people who are in really insecure, vulnerable housing situations or not have any housing at all. So people who are in kind of potentially in dangerous and abusive relationships or overcrowded conditions sleeping in cars, sofa surfing. All these people are still technically homeless. They're also at far greater risk of rough sleeping. So it's really important that people understand that it's a broader issue than the very visible side of rough sleeping. So what can we do to begin to tackle the problem? Well, I think there's a lot of things for us to think about as individuals, as a society, and also politically and the way we fund homelessness services. I think One of the things we're calling for, and I think will make a huge difference in the long term, is a greater supply of affordable housing so that we have real options for people who are being supported away from the streets into our accommodation-based services like hostels and other services to move on and to thrive in the community in independent accommodation. I think as individuals, I think it's important we talk about the issue. I think it's important that we all try and understand the issue, realise it's not a lifestyle choice. It's not anyone's fault, but often people have experienced a lot of complex trauma, a lot of mental health issues. And if we do see someone sleeping on the street, we can refer them to thestreetlink.org, which is a service that will connect them with the right kind of support to exit that situation. I suppose it's really looking at the needs of the individual taking each situation case by case. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's really important that we do understand the reasons why someone has become homeless and not only what their needs are and the risks they may be facing, but also what they want from life, what are their aspirations. It's really important that when we are supporting people, we talk to people about what they want to achieve and what they have had in the past that they want to regain and all those kind of things. It's really important that it's a personalised offer that not just St Mungo's, but all support organisations make when we're working with people to ultimately try and transform their lives and recover from what is a quite a desperate situation. And how do we stop people falling into the cracks once again after they've received help? Yeah, it's a really good question because there is a significant proportion of people sleeping on our streets who have been in that situation before, moved into accommodation and then come back again. There's a lot of things we can do. I think a lot of it can be about kind of social isolation when people move off and out of the area they're used to. And I think we deliver a number of services, including one called Keeping in Touch, which will touch base with someone when they've moved on into their own accommodation and just check how they're doing. And often it can be quite a small intervention, such as some advice around budgeting 
or something of that nature or connecting them with a local community group that can actually prevent homelessness so it's not always a really complicated thing but it's just it is important that we stay in touch with people when they move on and that ultimately people form connections within their wider community and has it changed over the years as far as who you're finding is needing support I think what perhaps has been on the increase more recently is people who are economic casualties and are sleeping rough because they simply don't have the money rather than having lots and lots of very complex needs. There's all sorts of people out there who have got a lot going on and have experienced a lot of trauma in their lives. But we are seeing a number of people who are losing their accommodation because of the cost of living crisis, not able to make ends meet and finding themselves sleeping rough. The range of needs is really complex and often people have more than one of those needs so people may be experiencing mental health difficulties they may also have an issue with alcohol they may also have some complex physical health concerns so it's about getting all the right support in place and really helping that person navigate what can be quite a complicated system to get the right kind of help yeah and hopefully the things we've been talking about today will start to help those that are in need i just would like to thank you and your listeners for the time and the opportunity to speak about what's obviously a a really really difficult situation at this time of year and if anyone does want further information or wants to get in contact everything that i've talked about and more can be found on our website at mungos.org that's great and we'll put that link into the podcast notes for our january 2024 show so if you're listening on the radio you can download the podcast now and see that information thank you Thank you. That's Matthew Boarding from Legion Homeless Charity, St Mungo's. A space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. That's all for this month's show. If you're listening on the radio, you can catch up with the podcast right now on Apple, Spotify and Amazon. And we've got the back catalogue as well. All these spaces to speak your mind. So if you want to dig deep, you can find out loads of topics that we've been talking about over the last few years. And for support and more information for better mental health, visit cornwallmind.org or call the Mind Helpline during office hours on 0300 123 3393. There is also a 24-7 NHS local urgent mental health response phone line, which is free to access by anyone, any age on 0800 038 5300. And you can call the Samaritans anytime for free on 116 123. All those details are also on the notes of the podcast. So if you are listening to the radio, just download the podcast, A Space to Speak Your Mind on Apple, Google or Amazon, and you'll find all the details in the notes of the show. If you'd like to be part of the programme, you can get in contact with us. Our email address is a space to speak your mind at gmail.com. And to find out more about the show, just follow Cornwall Mind on Facebook or Instagram or on their website, cornwallmind.org. I'm Richard, thank you for joining me, and I look forward to you joining us next time here on A Space to Speak Your Mind. A Space to Speak Your Mind with Cornwall Mind. <laughs>